everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Delays and Damages, LAD Insights and Updates for Developers. My name is Agalia J. Munasami. I'm a senior associate with Mao Wing Kwai and Associates, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, let me introduce you to the firm and what we do. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Mao and Chai and Associates is a mid-sized law firm which was founded in 1985 by Datuk Ma Wen Our ABLE team today comprises of 28 lawyers with a support team of 35. Datuk Ma is today a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises SMEs, family businesses and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, arbitration, and adjudication, a dedicated employment industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice group indicates some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 MCO situation, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsels. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. In the event you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. Details will be given at the end of this talk. We have two speakers for today. Noel will be speaking first on the effect of deposit payments on the date of completion and validity of an extension of time given by the controller of housing. And Michael will be speaking on notice of vacant possession and the delivery of keys and delivery of vacant possession and the connection of utilities. We will then conclude with a Q&A session. Allow me to introduce you to our speaker, Michael Ko. Michael Ko is a senior associate in our dispute resolution department. He has a bachelor of laws from the University of Leeds. Michael Ko was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2013, and he did the Bar Professional Training course at Nottingham Trent University and is a member of the Honorable Society of the Middle Temple. Michael's area of practice includes construction, general litigation, debt recovery, arbitration and adjudication, and employment. Our next speaker for the day is Noel Aoyong, who is an associate in our dispute resolution department. Noel has a Bachelor of Law from the University of Essex. She was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2020. 
Noel has also completed her LLM in Bar Professional Training at City University of London and was called to the Bar of England and Wales and is a member of Society of Lincoln's Inn in 2019. Noel's area of practice includes construction law, land disputes, and intellectual property. If you have any questions, please don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A chat box below. Noel, I think I will let you take the floor. Thank you, Agalia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noel Aoyong, and I will be the first speaker for today's session. So today we will be talking about the delivery of vacant possession and also the calculation of the liquidated and certain damages. I will begin the session today by speaking on the effect of deposit payments on the date of completion and the validity of an extension of time given by the controller. What is delivery of vacant possession? In simple terms, the delivery of vacant possession means the bare property and any other fittings and furnishings listed in the sale and purchase agreement are delivered or given to the purchaser, which is the home buyer, upon the completion of the home buying transaction process. Now, we'll move on to the time of delivery of vacant possession. So the time of delivery of vacant possession is stipulated in the Housing Development Control and Licensing Regulations 1989, Schedule G and Schedule H. So this Schedule G and Schedule H will be your sale and purchase agreement. Schedule G is for landed residential property, for example, bungalow or terrace houses. And Schedule H is for the residential unit in a subdivided building, which is, for example, flat, condominium, apartment, landed strata or townhouses. Now, Clause 25 of Schedule H, uh, which is similar to Clause 24 of Schedule G, says that the vacant possession of the property shall be delivered to the purchaser in the manner stipulated in Clause 27 within 36 months from the date of the SBA. And developer fails to deliver the vacant possession of the property in the manner stipulated in Clause 27 within the stipulated time, then the developer shall be liable to pay the purchaser the LAD liquidated damages calculated from day to day at the rate of 10% per annum of the purchase price from the expiry of the period stipulated in sub clause 1, which is 36 months, until the date the purchaser takes vacant possession of the said parcel. Now, for Schedule G under clause 24, the time of delivery of vacant possession will be 24 months from the date of agreement. So it's 36 months for high rise property and 24 months for landed property. Now, clause 27 of Schedule H, which is similar to clause 26 of Schedule G, Typically, it's the manner of delivery of vacant possession. So the developer shall let the purchaser into possession of the property upon the following. The issuance of certificate of completion and compliance. The separate st strata title relating to the state parcel has been issued by the appropriate authority. Water and electricity supply are ready for connection to the property. I will not be going into details on this because later on my colleague Michael will be covering on this issue. Now, but for now, just know that in order to say that the vacant possession has been actually or properly delivered, all these conditions must be met by the developer. And also do take note that clause 27 sub 3 of the Schedule H, which is similar to clause 26 of Schedule G is that there is a winning provision of 30 days. So upon the expiry of 30 days from the date of service of a notice of vacant possession from the developer requesting the purchaser to take possession of the property and whether or not the purchaser has actually entered into possession or occupation of the property, the purchaser shall be deemed to have taken delivery of the vacant possession. Now, when does the time start running? Clause 25 sub 1 of Shadow H says that the time would start running from the date of the agreement, which is the S. So typically it would start from the date of the SBA, where the, the date where parties sign the agreement. However, there are some instances where the date of commencement can, can be a bit different. Although developers are prohibited from collecting any booking fees or deposit pursuant to regulation 11 sub 2 of the Housing Developers Control and Licensing Regulations 1982. It still remains a common industry for developers to request for payment of a booking fee from the purchaser. It is not unusual for the SBA to be executed by the party several months after the payment of such booking fees or deposit. So in this instance, if the purchaser has paid the booking fees or deposits to the developer prior to the execution of the SBA, the period for delivery of vacant possession will commence from the date the purchaser paid the booking fee or deposit and not from the date of the signing of the SBA. This is what the federal court said in the case of PJD Regency. The court said that 
where a developer fails to deliver a vacant possession according to the time stipulated in the statutory sale and purchase agreement, the calculation of the LAD begins from the date of payment of the booking fee and not from the date of the statutory agreement. And the reasoning was that if the court takes the date of the agreement to mean the date of SBA, the court would be condoning the developer's attempt to bypass the statutory protections offered to the purchaser by the legislative scheme put in place. So the calculation, if booking fees or deposit has been paid by the purchaser prior to the execution of the SBA, the date will start running from the payment of the booking fee or deposit. So now there is another two more key points that we can take note of from this case. The court also held that the calculation of the LED shall be based on the actual purchase price and not the actual purchase price as stipulated in the SBA and not the discounted price. So any rebate granted by the developer in this case is to be disregarded. And aside from that, the date of completion of common facilities shall be based on the date of the certificate of completion and compliance. So the court said that the date of completion shall be based on the date of certificate of completion and compliance, which is the CPC, and not the certificate of practical completion, which is the CPC. Now, I will move on to the next issue, which is the valid validity of an extension of time given by the controller of housing. The standard form, the standard SBA prescribes for 24 months or 36 months for completion. However, developers can obtain extension of time for the completion. Now, in the Ang Lee case, the very famous Ang Lee case, the federal court held that the controller of housing does not have the power to extend the completion of time of a housing development beyond the prescribed period as stipulated in Schedule G and Schedule H of the regulations. Now, the court held that the controller's power under Regulation 11.3 of the Housing Development Regulations was ultra-virus of the Housing Development Act. So the controller actually has no power to grant any extension of time to the developer. So the question is who can grant the extension of time to the developer? Can a Minister of Housing and Local Government grant extension of time for the developer to deliver vacant possession? The answer is yes. So now in the case of Blue Dream City Development, the main point that we're taking is that the Court of Appeal has distinguished the case of Ang Ming Lee where the decision to extend time for vacant possession is made by the controller and not the minister. So in the case of Ang Ming Lee, the decision was made by the controller and not the minister itself. And regulation 11 sub 3 of the regulation does not take away the power of the minister to make a decision to waive or modify the terms of the scheduled SPA. But even without the regulation 11 sub 3, section 24 sub E of the Housing Development Control and Licensing Act also allows the minister to do so. The minister retains the power to grant an extension of time for the developer to complete the units. Now, in this case, the court also held that hearing the purchase in relation to the application for the extension of time would also make no difference to the application and would constitute a mere formality. So there's actually no need for the developer to come to the purchasers or to obtain any consent or approval from them before they go to the minister to apply for an extension of time. And in this case, the reasons given by the developer applying in applying for extension of time is not irrational. And the court finds no reason to interfere with the exercise of discretion vested in the minister. Crucially, the case of Blue Dream may allow developers to apply for extension of time so long as it is approved and signed by the minister instead of the controller. And ultimately, a balance must be sought between protecting the rights of the purchasers as intended by the case of Ang Ming Lee and the rights of the developer, especially where there are cogent reasons for an extension of time. Now, there's another case, the case of Obata, that distinguished the case of Ang Ming Lee. In relying on the case of Ang Ming Lee, because the extension of time was also granted by the controller in this Obata case, the purchaser commenced an action against the developer. The purchaser argued that it is entitled to claim for LED based on the 36-month delivery period pursuant to Schedule H of the regulations, despite the terms of the SBA that has already been signed by the parties. So in this case, it's a little bit different because the developer has raised the issue of the limitation period. Just so you know, a legal action to enforce one's right must be commenced within a certain period. This period is known as the limitation period. So in Malaysia, the limitation period will to commence an action for a breach of an agreement is six years. Now, the High Court in this Obata case agreed with the developer that the purchaser claim, now dissatisfied with the decision, the purchaser appealed to the Court of Appeal. 
and the Court of Appeals decision hinged on the following columns of action. The SPAs were invalid at the time of signing, as the SPAs had failed to comply with the prescribed Schedule H, and that the developer had breached Schedule H of the regulations by amending the time for delivery of vacant possession from 36 months to 54 months. So the court held that since the purchaser challenged the validity of the purported amendment from the inception or execution of the SPA, meaning during the signing of the SPA, from the date of the signing of the SPA, the purchaser's cause of action would run from the date of the SPA. And the Court of Appeal agreed with the High Court that the purchaser's claim is time barred by limitation as the six years limitation period has expired sometime in 2018 because the SPA was signed in 2012. Since the action was filed in 2020, limitation had already set in and the purchaser could no longer claim against the developer for lady. Now, the case has actually gone to the federal court and one of the issues raised by the developer was whether the second actor theory applied, which is that the developer who had relied on the controller's decision in granting the extension of time, even if the controller's decision has been held invalid, would not be affected by such invalidation and shall be permitted to proceed with the subsequent action, which is to act on the extension of time granted. So by the operation of the second actor theory, the developer argued that the extension of time sought to be challenged by the purchaser Purchases exist in fact and can be realized and or acted upon by the parties. And the developer is saying that the extension of time and the modification of the clauses in the SBA by the developer must be held valid. So in this case, the appeal is actually currently still pending decision. So we don't know what is the conclusion yet, but the decision of this appeal could potentially affect the decision made in the Ang Ming Lee case, given that because in the Ang Ming Lee case, the controller's decision for extension of time was held invalid. That's why a lot of officers came to claim for based on the Ang Ming Lee case. So if in the Obata case, the federal court held that the second actor theory applies, then the purchaser might potentially not be able to claim for LED due to the extension of time. But there are also cases which affirms the position of the Ang Ming Lee case, and one of them being the Vignesh Naidu case, where the Court of Appeal held the Housing Development Act 1966 is a social legislation and in it, its main intention is to protect the interests of home buyers. And pursuant to the federal court decision in Ang Ming Lee, the Court of Appeal reaffirmed the position that the extension of time granted by the housing controller is null and void. And the housing controller has no powers to modify the 36 months period stipulated under the statutory SBA. The principles laid down in Ang Ming Lee are to be. The Court of Appeal also held that the principles laid down in Ang Ming Lee are to be applied retrospectively, meaning it applies to the past and future cases. And the argument raised by the purchasers in the Vignesh Naidu case that raised by the developers in the Vignesh Naidu case that the purchasers have accepted a token sum from the developer to waive their rights to pursue a further claim is not applicable as um, it would defeat the purpose of the social legislation. So an agreement cannot operate against a statutory right to claim for LED. And also in this case, the limitation of period, the court held that the limitation of period of six years should start from the time where the vacant possession is supposedly delivered to the purchaser under Schedule H. So previously in the case of Obata, the court held that the time would start running from the date of execution of the SBA. But in this case, the court has decided that it should start running from the date of delivery of vacant possession as that is when the damages, the breach of the contract arise. Now, I will move on to the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of vacant possession. And the governing clause relevant act would be the Temporary Measures for Reducing the Impact of Coronavirus Disease 2019 Act 2020 and the Temporary Measures for Reducing the Impact of Coronavirus Disease 2019 Amendment Act 2022. Now, Section 38C sub 1 of the amended act allows a developer to apply the Minister of Housing and Local Government, which is the Housing Minister, to exclude any period from 1st January 2021 to 31st December 2021 from the calculation of the time of delivery of VP. If the Minister is satisfied that the developer was unable to deliver VP due to the COVID-19, 
this relief is only available in respect of the first SBA entered into before the 31st of May 2021. And the Housing Minister is precluded from considering an application made after the expiry of the time period for a delivery of vacant possession or completion of the common facilities specified in the SBA. The impact on the liquidated ascertained damages caused by the COVID-19 would be that any period excluded by the Housing Minister under Section 38C Sub 2, which is from 1st January 2021 to 31st December 2021, will not be taken into account for the purposes of assessing the liquidated ascertained damages payable to a purchaser due to the failure of the developer to deliver vacant possession of a housing accommodation or complete the common facilities, as the case may be, and this is stipulated under Section 38C sub 5 of the amended Act. Now, in relation to the taking of vacant possession of the property, this is for the benefit of the purchasers. So if the purchasers cannot take possession of the property from the date of the notice of vacant possession during the MCO period, then the purchaser shall not be deemed to have accepted such vacant possession. And the modification brought about by Section 38D is significant as purchasers shall only be deemed to have taken vacant possession on the date of actual delivery of possession by the developers. For example, on the date the purchasers collect their keys or take actual possession of the properties. And as a result of the amended COVID-19 Act, a purchaser can now claim a higher liquidated ascertained damages from the developer. And this is because um, the calculation of the LED would now be extended to a period longer than the 30 days stipulated in the developer's letter in the event the developer's letter being the notice of vacant possession in the event the purchasers had collected their keys and vacant possession after the expiry of the 30 days. Now that is all from for my sharing today. I will now pass the floor to my colleague Mr. Michael Call. Thank you Noel. Good afternoon everyone. Hope everyone is keeping well. I know the information Noel has given is quite heavy, particularly if you are new to whether the construction industry or the legal industry. Please bear with me a while more. I will try and navigate the next part, which is the cutoff date for the calculation of LAD uh, as best as I can. Let me perhaps start off by asking the audience, perhaps you can participate a little bit in this section of my talk. And let me see or get your understanding. Have a look at the question on the screen. Now, it says, of the four options below, which option most accurately describes the cutoff date for the calculation of LA? I'll just pause here for a minute while you try and uh, answer the question, and I will slowly look at the poll that comes in. Thank you, everyone. I don't know if everybody has voted, but at the moment, I think I see 92 participants have voted. That's enough for now. So I think the majority of you have indicated it is the answer. So actually, the question I asked is, what, which one most accurately describes the cutoff date of the LAD? So the first option would have been the date the notice of vacant possession is issued. The second is the date the notice of vacant possession is received. And then there is the 30 days after the date of vacant possession is received and 30 days after the date of vacant possession is issued. Now, in my opinion, the most accurate answer among the four options available is actually C, 30 days after the notice of vacant possession is received. Now, the reason why I say that is if you look at the standard clause, you would typically see at clause 27 sub. Three, it reads, on the expiry of 30 days from the date of service of a notice from the developer, requesting the purchaser to take possession of the said property, whether or not purchaser entered into possession of occupation of the said property, the purchaser shall be deemed to have taken delivery of vacant possession. Now, the date of service is, it says here, upon expiry of 30 days from the date of service. So, hence, that's why the answer earlier is actually C, 30 days from the date of service. Why is it received and not issued? Now, it is the date received because there is a date of service may not necessarily be the date that you issue the date, the notice of vacant possession. If 
your date of the notice of vacant possession says 1st of March, you may actually send it a different day or it may be received a different day. If you send it by hand, then yes, the date of your notice of vacant possession would be the same as the date of receipt. But I believe most of you are developers and you would have hundreds of units to serve. So more often, and from my experience, more often than not, it is sent via registered post. And if you do it via registered post, you have to take into consideration the wordings of clause 32, which says that any notice, request or demand required to be served by either party under this agreement shall be in writing and shall be deemed to be sufficiently served. If it is sent by the party by registered post, the notice, request or demand shall be deemed to have been received upon the expiry of the period of five days of posting of such notice. Hence, it is not when the notice of vacant possession is issued, but 30 days after it is from the date of service and is served according to the deeming provision here, unless you serve it by hand. And uh, looking at the poll, I think man, most of you, in fact, say that no, the, the, the cutoff date should be actually the date the notice of vacant possession is issued. That means, i.e. the date of the notice of vacant possession. Some of you may question, why is the developer liable here to pay LAD when it has already issued that notice of vacant possession? Some of you may even argue that it seems unfair because the purchasers can then choose to delay collecting the keys and then you are, are then liable for that interim period that they collect the key. So if they collect 10 days from the date of notice of vacant possession, you are still liable for it. I can certainly understand where you're coming from. And what I will do in the next few slides is actually compare two conflicting high court decisions uh, in this respect. Now your position where you think that it's unfair for the developers, something that the court in Wong San, the high court in Wong San against tribunal, the, the Tututan Pembeli Ruma tribunal shared. Now, in that case, it was held that the developer should be liable to pay for liquidated damages until the date when the purchaser received the notice of vacant possession and not the date of the collection of keys. The second respondent, being the developer, takes the position that the actual date of delivery of vacant possession is the 24th of September 2020, i.e. the date when vacant the notice of vacant possession was given. The court took the view that the delivery of the vacant date of vacant possession ought to be the 12th of November when the applicant received the notice of vacant possession. And the reasons of the court is, although on the 12th of November, the keys was not handed over to the applicant being the purchaser, as yet since the latter only took hold of keys on the 19th of November, the calculation of the date of vacant possession ought not to be on the date of handing of the keys, but on the date vacant as it is of the considered view that the date of vacant possession cannot be left to the discretion of the owner purchaser as to when he or she would want to collect the keys. So if, if, if you are of the view, then certainly your view is as what the court expressed in Wong San. But let me share with you another case also reported in 2022. Wong San was in 2022 in another high court in 2022 as well. Same issue arose. This is the case of Lawrence Lim Cheng Po against Wealth Plateau Sinir Brahat. Now, in that case, there was it was a joint claim by about 71 purchasers. So there were 71 sale and purchase agreements under Schedule H of the housing development. And one of the issues raised was on the date of delivery. The developer argued that the vacant possession was given to all purchasers on the 30th of March. 2022, i.e. the date of the notice of vacant possession. The purchasers, on the other hand, asserted that the delivery date was actually between 13th to 29th of April, depending on each individual. But basically, they had different collection dates because of 71 different purchasers. But none of them exceeded the 30 days after the 30th of March, the, i.e. the notice of delivery of vacant possession. The argument, again, was that the, the developer raised that it should be the date of the notice of vacant possession. The court rejected the developer's contention. Instead, 
the court said that it is the considered opinion of this court the effect and relevant sub clauses of 27.2 and 27.3 of the aforesaid Schedule H sale and purchase agreement on delivery of vacant possession is that when a post completion notice of delivery of vacant possession has been issued by the developer to the purchasers, a purchaser who takes the keys and vacant possession before the expiry of 30 days thereafter is regarded as having taken delivery of the vacant possession on the day he or she takes actual vacant possession. In short, what it, it, it really means is that given how Clause 27 is drafted, it is not the date of the notice of vacant possession, but it is the date the keys are collected or the expiry of the 30 days under uh, Clause 27 of Schedule H, whichever is the earlier date. Now, the reason the court gave here for this decision is that the relevant subclause in Schedule H is a statutory contract which cannot be contracted out or unilaterally excluded by any contrary words which the developer uses in a notice of vacant possession to the purchasers. So you have two differing positions here. One says that it should be on the date of notice of vacant possession. The other says, no, it is the date keys are actually collected or the expiry of the 30 days. Now, allow me to digress just a short while here. I wanted to highlight something I came across while I was preparing this presentation. I had a look at a sample of clients' uh, notice vacant possession. A, a example was given and it basically said that we are pleased to inform you that the project is completed and now you can collect the project or you may come and collect the keys. And then they attached the CCC together with the notice of vacant possession. What struck me was that there was a notice here that says you are required to comply with the above and take possession within 14 days from the date of this letter. Now, just to highlight to our audience today that you the schedule H, the clause itself says 30 days. So you cannot change it from 30 days to 14 days as, as exactly said in the case of Lawrence Lane where you cannot contract out or change the terms just by giving a letter or notice of victim possession. So that means to say, even if your letter says 14 days, the purchaser still has 30 days to collect the keys. And it is only on the expiry of those 30 days that there is a deeming provision to add that it expires after the 30 days. So there is obviously a conflict between the two high court decisions. What do you do? My personal opinion is that if you are still at the planning stage of delivering vacant possession, it is better that you assume that Lawrence Lim is the prevailing authority. It is better for you to be a little bit conservative and that way face less issues. Now, the re there's another reason why I say you should assume Lawrence Lim is the prevailing authority. Now, in the case of Wong San, although I know it appeals to many developers, neither in Wong San's case, neither the developer's lawyers nor the purchaser's lawyers highlighted to the court the application of Clause 27, meaning to say the court, when it delivered its decision to say that if uh, the cutoff date is from the no date of notice of vacant possession, it was not, the attention of the court was not drawn to the operation of Clause 27. So they didn't actually consider how it would affect the cutoff date. Now, allow me to just caveat here and say that if you are already fighting a case, where you insist that there is a date of notice of vacant possession. Let me just say that it may be a possible argument to take, but it would be difficult and I think it would be very fact-centric to your case and it would have to be turned uh, a lot on some of the circumstances on your case. But nevertheless, if you're in the planning stage, I highly suggest that you apply the decision of Lawrence Lim. So to recap, let's take an example. In scenario one, if you have a completion date, contractual completion date, say on the 5th of March, 2024, and you issued, because you planned ahead, you issued the notice of vacant possession earlier, say on the 1st of March, and the keys are collected on the 12th of March, you would then be potentially liable for the seven days between the contractual period and the date of collection of the keys. So scenario two, let's say, same instance, but let's say the collection of keys is only in April, let's say the 30th of April. 
2024. You would then be liable for that period between the contractual date of vacant possession to the date vacant possession is deemed to have been taken. That means the, that means the expiry of the notice of vacant possession. Why did I say you're liable for 26 days and not the 30 days in case there's any confusion? Because in this scenario, the notice of vacant possession was sent earlier and deemed to have been delivered before the contractual date for completion. If you send the notice after, let's say you send your contractual date of completion is here, you send perhaps on the 7th of March, then uh, obviously the time will run, the deeming provision, the deeming date will run and you'll be liable for additional days. Now, let me move on to the final topic, which is the manner of the delivery of vacant possession. Now, why I draw this case is because there was a federal court case that made a determination on the words ready for connection. Clause 27 of the standard SBA says that the developer shall let purchaser into possession of the said property upon the following. One of the items here is that water and electricity supply are ready for connection to the said building. Last year, the federal court case in Remigius Krishnan against SKS Southern Sindran Berhad, I will refer to this case as SKS Southern, held that ready for connection means that water supply and electric supply must be connected. Now, the facts of that case is basically via notice dated 24th April, the developer informed the purchaser of its readiness to deliver vacant possession of the property. Vacant possession was delivered with no electricity connection to the property. The application to TNB was only sent in June, 19th June 2018, and the deposit paid on 26th June 2018. So one of the claims before the court was for damages because the developer had allegedly breached the SPA by delivering vacant possession without electricity connected to the property. Now, before I read you the decision of the federal court, we are aware that some consultants and professional guidelines out there do suggest or say that so long as the utilities are installed, the property can be delivered. Let me just say that it's possible that these guidelines have not been updated since the federal court's decision or that they were prepared when they saw the Court of Appeal's decision. The Court of Appeal in this case held that ready for connection does not mean actual supply. The federal court disagreed. It said, with respect, this cannot be correct, the correct interpretation because it overlooks clause 1K of the SPA, which must be read together with clause 271C of the which provides for ready connection. Federal court held that it must follow that there was an obligation on the developer to provide actual supply of water and electricity to the property. Any in other interpretation would be unfair to purchasers, save for the payment of any deposits for the supply of water and electricity in the SPA provided for it. So what does clause 1K say? Clause 1K actually says, ready for connection means electrical points and water fittings and fixtures in the parcel have been installed by the developer and are fully functional and supply is available for tapping into individual parcels. So this is the timeline in the SKS Southern case. You will note here that I plotted it out. The notice of vacant possession was on the 24th of April, 2018. Now the facts of the case is we don't really know when actual vacant possession was taken. All that is available in the, the reported judgment is the date of the notice of vacant possession. So this is the date the application was made and this is the date deposit was made. So in that case, the tribunal awarded the purchaser 63 days of LAD. What is of interest is that in this case, the federal court upheld the award of damages, even though vacant possession was not actually late. Now, under the contract, in this particular case, the developer was only required to surrender or complete the project in 2020, yet it had given the property two years earlier than the contractual completion date. Why then did the court award LAD? Court held, basically the federal court held that the purchasers were still entitled to damages because there was a breach to clause 27, which is the 
manner of delivery of vacant possession. And in assessing the damages, the court decided to uphold the tribunal's calculation. I think the key takeaway from this case is that when you deliver vacant possession to a property, you need to ensure that connection is complete and deposits have been paid. It's important that uh, it has to go up to the EU. The deposits have need to be paid. Even if you are early in delivering the property, you could be liable for damages as seen in the case of SKS Southern. So what if you are late in delivering, unlike the SKS Southern case, you are late in delivering the vacant possession and you are also late in paying the deposits. So let's apply SKS Southern case and the earlier scenario. So contractual vacant possession is in, on 5th of March, 2024. Purchasers collect keys, say, on the 12th of March, 2024. But you only pay the deposit to TNB on 14th of March. You could possibly be liable for the nine days from the contractual date up to the date you have paid the deposit to TNB. What happens if keys are not collected and the deposit is paid after VP is deemed to be have taken? In this case, Again, contractual VP date here. In provision ends here, but you only pay deposit to TNB. Then you may be liable for this entire period of 31 days. Now, I will say that there is some degree of uncertainty in this aspect because that is the court's decision here. If you read this particular paragraph that I have shown now, where the court says that the court of appeal took the position that no losses could have been suffered by the appellant here as the respondent was still within time frame for delivery of vacant possession. We are unable to accept this proposition. In our view, the time frame for delivery of vacant possession is quite separate from the manner of delivery of vacant possession. The appellant was entitled to claim for compensatory damages for breach of clause 27. This was a separate claim from any claim for liquidate, liquidated damages for late delivery of possession under clause 25. In the event, damages was justifiably ordered by the tribunal for delay of 63 days for breach of clause 27. So what the court is saying is that there may you may be liable on two fronts. One is for LAD and the other is for failure to deliver the property with electricity connected. So whether it means that you could be liable for both LAD and then on top of that compensatory damages, it remains possible. It's not very clear because obviously there may be an element of overlap here, double claim, but it is unclear at this stage. So with that, I will end today's talk by just cautioning you and reminding all of you, please take into account the decisions of Lawrence Lim and the decision of SKS, Southern, when you plan for the delivery of vacant possession to your purchasers. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and Noel, for your great insights on the delays and damages, LED insights and updates for developers. Let's move on to a few questions and answers that we have from our attendees today. We have a question from, from Mr. Ang Kai Wei. I will read out the questions and amongst you, you can decide who would like to answer this question. Yeah. So to mean to say the buyer is no longer allowed to claim LAD after lapse of six years from the date of breach, i.e. vacant possession date, then what is the remedy for the buyer? I believe many buyers will wait for the VP and sue for LAD after delivery of the VP for more than six years. Perhaps I can take this question. Okay, so just now I mentioned the case of Obata and also the case of Vignesh Naidu where the case of Obata says that the date would start running from the date of execution of the SBA. And the case of Vignesh Naidu said that the date would start running from the delivery of vacant possession, which is the breach. So now the courts are at liberty to actually either follow the case of Obata or the case of Vignesh Naidu. But I personally would be more inclined to adopt the argument or the decision in Vignesh Naidu because the court said that no liquid LED would arise at such an early stage, which is like during the execution of the SBA, as one could not ascertain LED before the delivery of vacant possession. And secondly, the court also said that if limitation starts to run on the date of the SBA, and if there is a delay, the claim for LED could only be made, made much later on the expiry of the 36 months, which is which would make the first 
if the claim for LED would start from the execution of the FBA, the first three months, three years would of the limitation period would for all intents and purposes be wholly illusory. Meaning if you start calculating from the date of execution of the S for the first three years, 36 months, you wouldn't know whether LED, the claim for LED would arise. It's safest to say that you start calculating from the date of delivery of vacant possession where you would actually find out whether there is a claim for LED. And also it could potentially depend on the facts of each case, but generally to begin an action for breach of agreement, you will need to commence it from the date of the breach. So you have to commence the action to claim for LED within six years from the date of delivery of vacant possession. Thanks, Noel, for your answer. Okay, we have another question, but we are running short on time, so we're going to keep this short and sweet. There's a question by an anonymous attendee. Can developer hand over vacant possession by way of notice for vacant possession for shop lot, not under HDA without CCC? Is anyone able to take this question? Maybe I'll take that. It's a bit... The context of the question perhaps needs some uh, added information. Perhaps the person who asked this can reach out to us. But I think in general, you, you, the again, in general, if there is a provision where they say the vacant possession, when you buy, when the developer has built it, he gives you notice um, that it's ready for collection, the keys are ready for collection, that he can hand over by way of vacant possession or giving them notice of vacant possession because the question i think here says it's not under the housing development act we oh sorry it says without ccc yeah we will have to look at your business because it's not a standard spa we would have to look at the spa itself person who sent this question perhaps you should reach out to us if it specifically said that it can be handed out without the ccc then I suppose that, that that means it can, but usually you have to have the either the CCC or the yeah at, at least the CCC ready. If not, then CPC. But you would have to reach out to us specifically. I think. Let me just quickly. I see one question here by Mister Kok Sun Lai. I think it's mentioned here that the payment is to be made by purchaser. So how can a developer be liable for something not under their control? I presume he meant not under their control. That, that is actually a very fair question. The situations that we have analyzed and looked at is basically where the developer is the one who gets the NB or the authorities to make the connection, put in the connection, and then they put in the initial deposit. So if in your specific case you are able to show, then suppose a counter argument could be made. But in the cases that we have, the SKS case, I believe, it was found that the developer has the, uh, the, the obligation to handle all of that and ensure that deposit applications and deposits, everything have been made. From my personal experience, I remember that it was my developer who paid the deposit for me to get the connection ready. Um, so I, I, in your circumstance, perhaps you could also reach out to us personally if you do, if you are really facing that issue. All right. Thank you, Michael, for your answers. They were succinct and clear. Just a quick one. I see another anonymous attendee putting a question on the vacant possession. I think she's referring to the Wong San case. Now, very, can I just say to the person who has posed this question, kudos, you have noticed something very interesting about the Wong San case. That's why I say the Wong San case is, is a bit, I would not put too much reliance on the Wong San case because there are a few things that were raised in Wong San's case. All right excuse me, rather a few things not raised or drawn to the court's attention in Wong's case. One of it was one I said was the deeming provision of the vacant possession. The other thing raised, not raised rather, was the effect of clause 35. I, I think if you are referring to that, to this anonymous, you're right, there's something wrong with the calculation there in Wong's time. I think because mostly because a lot of uh, details or clauses were not raised to the court's attention. All right, uh, attendees, uh, thank you for attending. But before I conclude, we have a few announcements to make. First of all, please join us again for our upcoming talk. Um, the upcoming topic will be redeemable, convertible preference shares. What is it and how can it benefit you? The speakers for this talk will be our partners, Cassandra Nicole Tomazios and our senior associate in our corporate department, Ms. Anis Mohamad Sohaimi. Also, please do join us for our upcoming academy talk titled 
Corporate Society Responsibility, CSR, Business and Human Rights. On 10th of May, 2024, from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. in the Ma Wengkwai Associates Conference Room with our consultant, Datuk Ma Wengkwai, who will be the speaker for this seminar. This workshop will cover all of the essential elements of leading companies to seamlessly integrate ethical practices, translating them into heightened revenues, enhanced brand loyalty, and increased market positioning. Don't miss out on this opportunity um, to gain valuable insights and secure the early bird price by scanning the QR code, which you can see down there um, on the screen, or, or clicking the link provided in the chat box. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and please let us know what you have thought of our talk. The link in the form will be posted in the chat box below. Thirdly, do follow our social media accounts um, to stay updated with our other talks and other related news. Fourthly, if you'd like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the phone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website and the link is also posted in the chat box. To our guests today, thank you for joining us. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. Thank you and see you at our next talk. Mm -hmm.